started, we are missing three members at the moment, but Terry's tracking people down here quickly. You want me to get going? All right, I'll call this meeting in order of the Chicago Metropolitan Agency for Planning. Um, again, this is uh, permitted by the state of Illinois. And we have a couple of things at the end of the meeting. We're going to go into executive session, and you'll be instructed to go to a separate room for that. And we'll do our business, and then uh, I will come out and then close the meeting at the end. But uh, that will pop up in your screen. We're ready to do that to take you into another room. Uh, the only change on the agenda is that uh, we'd like to introduce uh, uh, a representative appointed by the governor. I thought we mentioned last week that that was going to happen, and we have. Uh, I think he's still on the line, Dr. Uh, Abu Fawaz. Abu Fawaz Abu Fawaz on the line. I go with Kuros. That's easy. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Doctor. Sure, my he, pleasure. He comes from uh, a uh, Department of uh, Civil uh, Materials Engineering, Environmental Engineering at UIC. So we have uh, some expertise on uh, on the board. So we thank you. My pleasure. Looking forward to working with you and the rest of the board. Thank you. I hear some background noise. So anybody, please, uh, if you're not speaking, to mute your background. Thank you. And with that, I'll first uh, ask for uh, approval. Of, no, before I do that, uh, we have uh, a roll call. Aaron. That's right. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Bennett. Present. Rita Athis. Present. Frank Beal. President Brawley. Commissioner Cox. Uh, here. Mayor Darch. Here. Jim Healy. Mayor Nope. Here. President Reinbold. Here. Mayor Rottering. Here. Carolyn Schofield. Here. Deputy Mayor Sheehan. Here. Matt Walsh. Here. And Diane Williams. Present. Great, we have a quorum. All right, great, we have a quorum. And the first item on the agenda is the minutes. I'll ask somebody to identify themselves to make the motion to approve it and somebody to second it. Mayor, note to approve, motion to approve. And Mayor Browley from Montgomery, second. And also note that I'm here. Thank you. Thank you Moved and seconded. Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett. Aye. Rita Athis. Yes. Frank Field. President Brawley. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Uh, yes. Mayor Darch. Yes. Jim Healy. Mayor Nope. Yes. President Reinbold. Yes. Mayor Rattering. Yes. <laughs> Carolyn Schofield. Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan. Yes. Matt Walsh. Yes. Diane Williams. Not having been at the meeting, I abstain. Okay. The motion carries. This, this is the longest part of this meeting is the roll call, you know? It is. Well, we're going to have to get used to it. I, I, my apologies. No problem. What else are you going to do? Erin, your executive director's report. Great. Thank you, and I, thanks. It's good to see everyone this morning. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Regional Economic Recovery Task Force that we've been tasked with leading. So, you know, we assembled this task force at the request of the seven county board chairs and also the city of Chicago. I'd like to start by just playing a brief video of Mayor Lightfoot, President Preckwinkle, and Chair Cronin um, voicing their support for the task force, and then I'll get into my report here. Hello, everyone. I'm Mayor Lori Lightfoot, and I want to welcome you to today's virtual kickoff. When COVID-19 struck, our region launched a recovery task force in April, bringing together 200 members of cross-government, nonprofit, corporate, faith, and community organization to support our communities and our local economies. However, because the challenges of COVID-19 don't stop at Chicago's borders, we also included a committee on regional coordination to ensure a holistic and inclusive recovery. We would then accelerate this work through June and later publish the nation's first ever citywide recovery plan in July. And now 
We're proud to be moving into the implementation phase of this recovery work in Chicago and across the entire Northeastern region. This regional coordination has proven especially important because we learn from a regional perspective, recovery relies upon economic development, empowering our workforce and our tourism industry. Strengthening all of these sectors is clearly crucial to our overall recovery. But it will also require an all hands on deck approach. That's why we're excited to continue this recovery work with dedicated individuals such as yourselves to not only reignite our diverse economy, but build a stronger, more resilient future for our residents. So thank you very much for your participation and please remember to stay safe. This has been an incredibly challenging year. COVID-19 has impacted all of us. We've had to work harder than ever before to keep our residents safe, healthy, and able to put food on the table. We've had the highest unemployment rates since the Great Depression in the 1930s. People aren't just worried about getting sick. People are worried about losing their homes, their jobs, and their savings. COVID exacerbated the existing inequities in our society. Now more than ever, we need to keep equity in the forefront as we plan for the region's recovery. We need to increase economic opportunity and quality of life for all residents. COVID presents a unique opportunity to build back better from this tragic year. Now is the time to advance equity through increased investments in transportation, housing, and small businesses. In fact, my fiscal year 2021 budget includes a $20 million equity investment to support the ongoing needs of residents and businesses impacted by COVID-19. Systems and structures that are failing communities of color are failing all of us. Advancing racial equity is to our collective benefit. I like to quote former Senator Paul Welton, who often said, we all do better when we all do better. If we don't use an equity lens, this pandemic will only widen economic inequality. The Chicago region's diversity, strategic location, natural assets, and growing economy make us strong. We need to build on our strengths and think about what will benefit the whole region if we want to become stronger together. Thank you, Mayor Lightfoot and President Preckwinkle. We in DuPage join in commitment to the region. I believe we can realize opportunities for economic growth together. During these unprecedented times, we've seen e-commerce grow rapidly as the world connects electronically. The role our region plays in the movement of goods will be paramount. Trucking and transportation networks, infrastructure in and around O'Hare Airport play a crucial role in enhancing economic opportunities. Now is the time to implement the strategy spelled out by the task force, work our plan and achieve our goals. Thank you. Uh, we wanted to share this with you because we thought it was, you know, uh, a great kickoff to the, the work that we led last week. This uh, economic task recovery task force includes members from each of the seven counties and city of Chicago and really recognizes that the region is stronger when it works together as one. And I'll just also note too, the transportation is really the thread that runs through each of these three areas. So this task force is planned to schedule or scheduled to tackle um, economic development, you know, where businesses choose to locate, workforce, how people get to the places they need to go, and tourism, and how people get to the assets across our region, which increasingly uh, are important to stakeholders who live here in the region. By bringing together city and suburban leaders, experts, and advisors throughout the region, CMAP will help the region agree on some priorities, collaborate on solutions, and speak as one collective voice. The task force is co-chaired by myself and Paul Goodrich, who's representing the city of Chicago's COVID-19 recovery task force and True Chicago. The task force is really aimed at linking their work to what our private partners are doing in the same space to make it this public-private vision for the region. The three working groups, economic development, workforce development, and tourism will meet monthly over the next year to identify some immediate and long-term actions for the region. So also in a similar vein, on today's agenda, we're asking for your approval for assistance on a regional mobility recovery plan. We've been getting with the Regional Transportation Authority and our transit partners on what their needs and what their future may hold for transit. 
However, transit's only one component of our multimodal transportation system, and we really need to look at it holistically. So our goal with that project is to utilize your expertise and the partners around the table at the MPO Policy Committee to proactively address our post-COVID transportation needs. Got a few more notes here. I know that you all were aware that another big event took place uh, a week ago, a few weeks ago on November 3rd. As public servants, we look forward to working with all of our state and federal legislators and all 284 municipalities to implement policies that build resiliency and equitable, equitable transportation system and economic opportunity for all. We were heartened to see President-elect Biden's priorities aligned with CMAP's, CMAP's priorities in the ONTO 2050 plan, economic recovery, you know, uh, climate change and racial equity. So we will be reaching out to all of our new federal, county, and state representatives to make sure that they know of the resources and information that CMAP can provide them to be more successful in their roles. A note on transportation reauthorization. In October, the Senate and the President signed a continuing resolution to fund the government and also provided a one-year extension of the FAST Act through September 30th, 2021. So before COVID, we started to bring a working group of implementers and stakeholders and advocates together to talk about regional transportation needs so that we could speak in one voice to our congressional delegation and federal partners. When COVID hit, we pivoted the, to address uh, federal relief needs directly related to those issues. So now with this one year extension of the transportation bill and a new administration, we're going to refocus our efforts to be prepared to advocate for the transportation needs of our region, such as sustainable funding, addressing climate change and aligning funding with performance goals. So in January, we'll bring you our full federal and state agendas for your consideration. We look forward to hitting the ground running with these initiatives um, with you, our local partners and our federal partners. And then I just wanted to touch on a couple of things related to 2050. So service sharing, I know is something that we've been talking a lot about with our stakeholders here as the pandemic continues to cut into revenue sources more communities are looking at service sharing uh, with their neighbors. It's a key recommendation in the 2050 plan. So to help municipalities explore these options, we held a CMAP talks webinar a few weeks ago with municipal staff from Oswego, from Buffalo Grove and from Berkeley to share best practices from these communities. We'll share a link to the recording in the chat box if you wanna watch or share it with your uh, partners that you work with, we'd appreciate that. Um, and then we uh, continue to use the media as well as speaking engagements to promote ONTO 2050 recommendations. So um, a couple other things that I'll mention of note that happened over the past month or so is that um, we co-authored an op-ed with Arnold Randall, the superintendent of the Cook County Forest Preserve that was published in Crane's Chicago Business promoting equitable access to parks. And we did this because through the 2050 planning process, we noted that only 25% of residents live near parks and open space. And that's uh, across our region. And in more affluent areas, 50% have access to parks. But our goal for 2050 is to increase access to parks to 65% across our region. I was also interviewed in Cranes uh, by Cranes for a story along with Chair Cronin and Representative Mayfield from Waukegan on consolidation of local government services. We'll share links to those in the chat box as well. And then just finally, uh, late October, I spoke at the National Association for Metropolitan Planning Organizations to share some lessons learned from our STP shared fund process and how it really led to a more equitable distribution of federal transportation funding for projects of regional significance in this region. So many of our national colleagues are looking to us as they guide and um, as to how they can do some of this critical work as well and collaborate. So we were pleased to bring this resource and look forward to continuing to innovate how we do our work. So with that, it, that concludes my report. Happy to answer any questions. Any questions of Erin? Other than we're very excited, Erin, that uh, CMAP is going to facilitate uh, the uh, Regional Economic Recovery Task Force, uh, it's quite a challenge and I think we're up to it. And most importantly though, is the collaboration of uh, local government officials uh, to be part uh, and have a voice in how we're gonna go forward. So I know the mayors are, and county board chairs are, are, are very excited about the work uh, laid out before us and, and hopefully some, some good recommendations come down the road. Thank you. Nice. Under item five, Angela, there are five uh, items Good morning, CMAP board. Um, I wanted to bring to you today five procurements that I'm seeking your approval on today. Um, can everyone hear me? I'm sorry. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, great. Um, good morning again. So I'm seeking approval uh, for the agency to enter into a contract with Miletus uh, to develop a commercial service vehicle model and to design and conduct a commercial vehicle survey to collect that data that will be used to estimate vehicle trips that have a non-freight commercial purpose. Second uh, approval I'm seeking is for the agency to enter into a contract with EBP to develop a long range regional employment forecast that is required as part of the long range planning process in our core NPO activities. Erin uh, mentioned in her uh, prior presentation about a contract we're bringing to the uh, board for approval. It's a contract to enter into an agreement with AECOM to work with CMAP and regional partners in developing a visionary mobility strategy to support an equitable recovery from COVID-19 in the region. The fourth procurement we're seeking approval is to enter into a contract with APA to complete 14 to 15 of the uh, muni municipal, excuse me, pavement plans as part of the final phase of the pavement data collection and pilot pavement management program. And lastly, we're seeking approval of a resolution with Cook County for CMAP to access the Cook County Assessor's Office GIS data for research and analysis purposes. So those are the five procurements I'm seeking approval for today. I'm happy to answer any questions at this time. Are there any, any questions of Angela or the items on the agenda? Uh, none being, uh, can I have a board member? I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve in a second. Diane Williams, I move that we approve. Read it at the second. All right, there was a motion and a second. Again, any further comments? If not, uh, Aaron, read the roll call, please. Great. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Rita Athos? Yes. Frank Beale? Yes. President Brawley? Yes. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes. Mayor Darch? Yes. Jim Healy? Mayor Noak? Yes. President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rottering? Yes. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. And the motion carries. And the motion carries. Thank you. Moving Thank on you. to item, item six. Uh, Mayor Reinbold, do you have a committee report to give us? Yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we met this morning and staff gave the committee an update on the embedded staff planner program. Uh, as many of you know, this uh, work is funded in part by the MacArthur Foundation, uh, which I'm pleased to report on yesterday approved some of the staff recommended uh, changes to that program uh, that was approved on yesterday. Uh, staff also, also shared success stories from both Calumet Park and Sauk Village uh, embedded a planning program. Uh, a couple of the successes of note is both of these communities did receive Invest in Cook grant uh, as a result uh, of the embedded planner participation. Uh, under the uh, lessons learned, we were informed of three exciting new programs that CMAP will be kicking off on December 1st. Uh, they include embedding planners to implement LTA projects, a, a grant readiness program, and also a capacity uh, building consortium around specific topics. Uh, we also discussed in regards to that, the timeline, the community selection and partner opportunities in addition to funding opportunities. Uh, next, we heard an update on CMAP's work on the uh, local incentive guide. Uh, this guide was published in September. Uh, the shared findings uh, to date include uh, differences between the academic versus the local perspective on using incentives to attract development, uh, and also the impact incentives have on equity within the entire region. Uh, we did review uh, the recommended action items uh, under next steps. Uh, those include uh, updating data, uh, working with the Village of Richton Park to implement some of the guide recommendation actions 
and uh, we'll also be engaging with other communities in the future. Uh, we also heard report outs from the various advisory committees, chairs on topics they've been discussing in their meetings, uh, including climate change, traffic safety, uh, and COVID impacts. Uh, our next scheduled meeting uh, will be on January 13th. Uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mayor. That was a, a very good update on what's going on. Other questions of Mayor Rambold on the committee? None being, I'm sorry. I was just going to add that uh, a thank you to staff for pivoting. You know, the program that we had with the MacArthur Foundation was really focused on doing a number of pilots in communities for extended periods of time. And with COVID, one of the things we wanted to do is be as responsive as possible. So <laughs> we, we spoke to the MacArthur Foundation about developing some more tactical ways to help governments um, and really sort of aligning the COVID mm -hmm. rates with what the what municipalities are experiencing and what future needs they might have over the next 18 months here. So just wanted to highlight the work of staff being nimble in order to address community needs. Very good. Thank you. All right, under item number seven, Jason, on the uh, climate uh, focus area work plan. Thank you, Chairman Bennett, and good morning, uh, board members. And maybe it's too early to say it, but I'll say happy holidays anyway, as, as best you can. Uh, let's enjoy the holidays coming up. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to present an overview of uh, the climate work that we're doing this fiscal year, this current fiscal year. Um, and uh, a region prepared for climate change uh, is one of the three goals that were included in the environment chapter uh, of ONTO 2050. And uh, Michelle, if you'll click to the next, we'll get the other text on there. Um, I'll, uh, nope, not yet. Yep, right there. Um, I'll also add that uh, last year at around this time, um, through some strategic planning, leadership, uh, agency leadership determined that climate would be one of the three implementation priorities going forward for the next three to five years. Um, so this uh, work plan this year sort of represents the, a, a kickoff to implementing um, that component of the plan. Uh, so within this goal, there were two broad strategies. Uh, you see them on your slide to intensify climate mitigation efforts. That is reduce the amount of carbon being emitted into the atmosphere or reduce the amount of carbon in the atmosphere through other means. And the other is to prepare the region uh, for a changing climate uh, to become more resilient and to prepare our most vulnerable communities uh, for uh, what's to come. Um, and so, as I mentioned, this year's work plan marks the beginning of the implementation of ONTO 2050's climate goal. Next, please. As with most CMAP topics, uh, we have data uh, for multiple points in time that uh, can show us a trend. Um, in 2015, the transportation system represented 30% of the emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the region. Um, now, that's a lot. Um, it looks smaller than what you see in the dark green band, which is stationary energy. Actually, that band is typically broken up into things like energy generation, the use of energy in our buildings through burning of natural gas and other things, emissions from manufacturing. But on this graph, they are aggregated. In fact, transportation makes up the majority. If you break that green section up, transportation makes up the majority. The majority of the emissions in our region. Um, and so 30% is a lot, um, but the real story on this slide is on the right side. And that is the uh, trajectory from 2010, when we did our previous greenhouse gas inventory to 2015. Um, and as you can see in stationary energy and waste, uh, we had some improvements. We had some declines in the emissions. Um, however, uh, that is not the case on the transportation side. Um, I will say that overall, th there was a 7% decline from 2010 to 2015 in our emissions from 128 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, that's a mouthful, to 119. So a 7% decline, that's good news, but that's not what's happening in the transportation sector. Next slide, please. So if we look closer at the transportation sector, we can see in the left here that um, on-road emissions makes up the vast, vast majority 
of the emissions in the region. Um, and there's a distant second by off-road emissions. Uh, off-road emissions includes things like construction, includes things like mining, which we don't have a ton of, um, but there is some. Uh, and uh, other things like, um, you know, the running of lawnmowers and weed whackers and things that have basically no regulation. <coughs> Um, so on-road makes up the vast majority. On the right um, is, again, the trend lines, or at least two points in the trend um, that you can see here. So on the, on the left band is the on-road emissions, and you can see that from uh, in that five-year period, that remained relatively flat, um, as did the next three uh, components of that sector. But the off-road off emissions ticked up slightly. Um, we're not entirely sure why that's the case, um, but you know, between 2010 and 2015, there was a lot of economic stimulus happening, a lot of construction was happening. Um, we also know that there was an increased uh, number of intermodal transfers within our region, which may be contributing to that as well. Um, but um, as we can see the, in the transportation sector, we are going a little bit in the wrong direction. Um, and that's something obviously that's within our wheelhouse. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we also did some simple projections from 2015 out to 2050. Um, and just very simply and very quickly, we have a business as usual trajectory of emissions. We have a current trend, which is the middle line, and we have a climate stabilization path, which is the green line. Business as usual reflects um, a situation in which the per capita emissions, the emissions per person stays the same from now until 2050, but as our uh, population increases, of course, the total emissions are going to increase apace. The current trend, uh, the, the sort of slightly downward black line in the middle um, is, a, is matching the decline that we saw between 2010 and 2015. So, if that 7% overall decline continued year over year through 2050, that's where we would end up um, during that year. Uh, the green line, uh, which is the uh, ambitious line, but it's also the line that we really should be shooting for, is the climate stabilization path. And that dotted line at the bottom of the graph here represents the level of emissions at which uh, scientific consensus um, suggests uh, would help stabilize the climate at about a 1.5 degree uh, uh, centigrade temperature increase. Um, and so that is the target that we have set. Um, and that number represents an 80% reduction from the 2005 value by the year 2050. As you can see, we have some work cut out for us. Uh, next slide, please, Michelle. Uh, so, um, you know, this graph, uh, we've all seen many variations of this graph. Um, if we do nothing, the trend here of increasing temp temperature and increasing precipitation is simply going to continue. Um, so I don't want to dwell on this. Some of our data, you know, data geeks like me like to look at what the data actually looks like. Next slide, please. Other people are more... Um, uh, captured, I guess, by photographs, maps, other things, other ways to visualize what's happening. And um, so, you know, we could expect more of what's happening in the left image. Um, and uh, in fact, what, what we've found that um, over the past century, uh, the number of two inch rainstorms that we've received has approximately doubled. So we're getting double the number of two inch rainstorms per year. Um, than we were a century ago. Uh, the other important factor here is that our infrastructure, our stormwater infrastructure, which for many decades was designed to accommodate a hundred year storm, that is a storm that is, has a 1% chance of happening in any single year. Well, those storms are happening much more frequently. And so uh, what's happening, and as precipitation continues to climb, is that over time, our infrastructure is becoming less and less adequate for uh, uh, adapting or to accommodating the amount of rainfall that we're getting. So um, something we ought to really be thinking about since we ex experience a lot of flooding in our region. Uh, and the map on the right simply uh, shows that um, uh, by the mid-century and end of century, 
Uh, Illinois may have a climate that's more akin to Louisiana, Texas. Me personally, I like I like New Orleans. I like Nashville. I like Austin, Texas. Um, but you know, uh, you know, nicer weather in Chicago is not really what we're talking about. There are many other impacts that we're going to be facing, including public health, um, and and really impacts on our most vulnerable vulnerable populations is where it's going to hurt the most. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Now pivoting. Um, it's not as if we've been ignoring. This challenge up until on to 2050 was adopted. Um, in fact, we've uh, done a number of things over the years. Um, they include uh, guidebooks, toolkits for local governments. They include strategy papers uh, that were leading up to on to 2050. Um, we've done uh, quite a bit of work around flooding um, and helping communities to prepare for flooding um, and so on. Um, but uh, on to 2050 really established the agency's position on climate. And um, as I mentioned in 2019, uh, under Aaron's direction, uh, the, the agency leadership identified climate as one of the three priorities that we're gonna work on very hard for the next three to five years. Uh, the other two priorities are the transportation system and the regional economy. So um, <laughs> obviously this is a priority for the agency and for the region as well. Uh, next slide, please. So those examples were a little bit um, more distant history. More recently, um, we've been doing some stuff as well. Um, in the uh, spirit of uh, working in partnership, uh, we have been working with and supporting actually the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus uh, lead on a project that has been supported by the Global Covenant of Mayors. Um, and this is a regional guide for local climate action. It is a, a fairly comprehensive guide that local governments can uh, take on and identify the kinds of things that they can be doing to help address this climate challenge. Um, just an aside here, the Global Council of Mayors is actually a European Union organization that provided technical assistance and other kinds of support to the Mayor's Caucus to get this project done. Um, frankly, it's a little bit embarrassing that the European Union is setting resources to the wealthiest country in the world to <laughs> help us get on board with the climate challenge, but such as it, as it is, um, we were thankful nonetheless. Um, on the LTA side, we have a project that's just, um, just sort of ramping up, and that's with the Central Council of Mayors. We'll be working with them to examine their transportation system and areas where it may be vulnerable to flooding um, and work on ways to make their transportation system more resilient. And then on the, comp on the uh, communications side, uh, we uh, have been conducting CMAP talks. Uh, these are facilitated conversations among our partners and experts. Um, we did a series on regional stormwater resilience with our county stormwater agencies to talk about, uh, you know, looking out into the future, what are you thinking about? and how are we gonna accommodate this, this changing climatic pattern? Um, and then finally, a number of updates um, were created and posted um, around uh, how climate and the COVID challenge um, sort of play off one another. Next slide, please. So these activities are connected to our climate work plan for this year. Um, and so I'm pivoting now to give you an overview of that work plan. And you can click once more, please, Michelle. Um, and uh, these are the five projects that are in our uh, uh, climate focus area work plan for this year. Um, this first one is called uh, Climate Multi-Year Implementation Planning. Quite simply, um, this is a project in which we are going to take stock of where we are as a region, uh, what our role is, uh, where we're going as an agency, and how to get there. Um, typically, we do work planning for a single year, the, next, the, the coming year, but um, Aaron has given us the direction to look further out, which I think is brilliant and a great idea um, to look further out to three to five years, because just looking to the next year isn't really going to help us address these uh, wicked challenges, as we call them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about our progress on that project in just a moment. Uh, the second project is uh, transportation mitigation strategies. Um, and this is right in our wheelhouse, obviously. 
it's an area that we know we have a role in and that we are going to have to uh, think very seriously about what our uh, role is going to be and how we're going to try to move this forward. So in this project, we're exploring what mitigation strategies make sense to pursue here, starting with a list of over 100 and narrowing them down to something more reasonable that we can study and model in more detail to figure out what best works in our region. Uh, the third project is uh, climate mitigation and adaptation technical assistance. This is the project whereby we're going to try to integrate uh, strategies into our local work. So that's our local technical assistance program, our capacity building program, the, the programs whereby we are working directly with locals to, um, to help them with uh, decision making and provide resources and so on. The fourth project is around data. Um, this is where the greenhouse gas inventory work lives. We hope to do another one for the year 2020 in the next um, fiscal year's work plan. Um, and we also hope to produce uh, emissions profiles for every community in the region, which we think might be helpful as they uh, plan to deal with um, this climate challenge. And finally, uh, greenhouse gas reporting and monitoring. We have modeled and tracked air quality components for some time now through our conformity work, uh, but we have not been doing that for uh, greenhouse gases. Um, there's been no standard, there's been no mandate to do so, so uh, naturally we haven't done it, but um, I think we're having a change of heart now that this is something that we ought to be doing. And this project is a, an effort to explore how we uh, are going to go about doing that. What kind of modeling are we going to do? Uh, so on and so forth. So next slide, please. Uh, so a little bit of progress that I'd like to report out on um, this first project that I mentioned. And this is the climate multi-year implementation planning work. Um, and the goal here is to understand what's happening in the region, who's doing what, what our role could be um, and where we're going to be going over the next three to five years. These are the steps in the process um, at a very high level. We've um, completed more or less stakeholder discussions and peer review, although that will be an ongoing thing. We'll always be checking in with those different parties. But for this project, we've completed those and we're now in the stage of identifying and prioritizing the project list. But let me tell you some of the um, results that we've heard um, from some of our engagement. Next slide, please. Um, so in our peer review research, these are some of the things that um, we know our, our uh, peers are doing. Um, they're conducting vulnerability assessments at both the regional and local scale. Greenhouse gas emission inventories is something that most many of them are doing. Um, very obviously, they're focusing on transportation mitigation strategies, uh, working on building decarbonization. And um, of course, as we already know, partnering and providing resources is critical to implementing their uh, climate goals. Next, please. We also talked to quite a few people in the region um, who work in this climate space uh, to understand um, what's going on. And here are some of the things that we heard. Um, we understand that energy and building sectors um, are moving. There's advancement there, uh, but it was very obvious to us that transportation mitigation work is not really advancing in any major way. When we did ask about transportation mitigation, we heard a lot about electrification. Maybe that's just the flavor of the month or the year. Um, but it, it tends to be getting the most attention these days. We also heard about mode shift, transportation demand management, and land use. Um, but electrification is something that's on the lips of many, many who are working in this space. Other suggestions, reach out to the equity community to get a fuller perspective. Um, also, recognition that locals are very short on resources and knowledge and data and knowing how to move forward. Um, so these are things that we, I think we knew, but um, it's good to confirm them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we also asked about what CMAP's role could be. Um, and some of this is gonna be obvious to most of you. Um, and many of the people we talk to know CMAP and know the kinds of things that we do. So these are probably not that surprising. Um, we could have a regional coordination and convening role. Okay, we're already doing that, right? Obviously, transportation sector climate strategies is an area where we want to put uh, quite a bit of focus. 
um, data monitoring analysis and information dissemination, um, like the greenhouse gas inventory, for example, um, providing direct local assistance, capacity building, and burial removal, burial, barrier removal strategies like um, model ordinances, guidebooks, tools, and direct assistance, helping communities actually um, surpass these barriers. Uh, and then a couple of other things, making sure our infrastructure and our communities are resilient to the coming climate changes. And uh, finally, climate friendly economic growth, which I won't get into in any detail here today. Uh, next, please. Uh, we're at the stage now where we're identifying and prioritizing climate projects. Uh, this is running concurrent with our FY22 work plan and budget development process, which is underway now. Uh, and the goal is to identify pathways and projects to achieve long-term goals in this climate space. Um, we'll use a few different filters to figure out what we ought to be doing, um, which are uh, listed in these last two bullet points. Um, what kinds of implementation avenues might we have? What kind of urgency is there? What kind of leverage and support are there? Uh, for uh, the different projects we would like to do and so on. So we're gonna be using a process of elimination um, to try to get to a manageable set of projects. And uh, one more click, please. Um, and so this is uh, my final slide, uh, just a recap of the projects that are um, in uh, the work plan and uh, just some, some final takeaway messages here. Uh, one. Some emissions sectors are heading in the right direction. Transportation is not. Uh, secondly, we know where we have to go in order to avoid the worst impacts of a changing climate, and we know the ways to get there. And third, uh, CMAP has an important role to play in the region on this topic. We have a focus on the long term and the large scale. We provide regional guidance for transportation investments. We research and advise on policy at multiple scales. We provide data and tools to assist decision makers. And five, we convene regional partners to catalyze action. Um, and one final comment before I wrap up, we were on a call with uh, NARC yesterday talking about a NOAA proposal that we're putting together that they are excited about. Uh, but they commented that they are going to be sending um, a memo to the new administration um, suggesting that, that regions are the right scale at which to be addressing this climate challenge. And I might say that I agree with that. And so um, hopefully we'll be doing that uh, for the foreseeable future. So thanks very much. Um, I, maybe we have time for questions. I'll, I'll ask Aaron and the others if we do. And if not, I thank you for your time this morning. Thank you, Jason. That was a lot to comprehend and a lot to think about going forward. Uh, board members, you have questions of Jason? This is Jim Healy. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Jim. Yeah, I was wondering, have we looked at what impact uh, on current trends that uh, climate change will have on the levels of Lake Michigan? I know they're already getting higher. Have we looked at what will end up, you know, the possibility of what will end up happening on Lake Michigan? Yeah, good question. Um, we have not. Uh, some others have, um, particularly at the state level, and some of the Great Lakes organizations have been looking at that. Um, uh, you know, I, I can tell you that the, the projection, project, projections are variable. Some of the projections say there will be more, some will say that there will be less. More precipitation versus more heat. Heat means evaporation out of the lake. Um, so it's a little bit hard to say. Um, but, uh, you know, I can say I live by the lake and I can tell you that it's down from where it was at a peak in the middle of the summer. So I don't know if that's going to continue or not, but we haven't done that work, but, um, I think it's something that we ought to, ought to certainly look at. Jason, I just have a quick question, certainly for the, uh, item on storm water management. Uh, and you are correct. Obviously, we all know and realize uh, the, the numerous uh, two-inch rainfalls that we've had over the last, uh, you know, five to six years. Uh, in Ch in the Chicago metro area, it's the MWRD, and certainly for the surrounding counties, it's also their county stormwater groups. Are you working with them? Uh, implementing a change in any direction would be incredibly costly. All of our systems are designed for a hundred year. And how are they going to go outside the box without redoing the entire system 
uh, to come up with some type of plan that could augment uh, uh, or certainly uh, uh, attempt to rectify how we go forward with additional uh, rainfall. So we are. Um, this year we initiated a quarterly uh, convening of the regional stormwater agencies from the different counties. Um, and we're starting to invite some of the other state players, um, the Illinois State Water Survey, which does modeling and other things. Um, incidentally, the, the State Water Survey also came out with the most recent precipitation tables that are used to, uh, as, as guideposts for designing infrastructure. And I think all of the counties have adopted those new precipitation tables that they will now require developers or those who are building stormwater infrastructure to adhere to. Um, so uh, we do have new data. Um, how they incorporate that data and, and is, is one thing. As I say, they've already done that. Um, and they're also starting to update their standards and update their regulations and so on and so forth. What we're trying to do is to talk to them about, okay, but every time we update that, those data tables, which are actually backwards looking, right? They look at trends over the last you know, five decades in order to make uh, precipitation tables for today. Well, next year, the precipitation amounts are already continuing to go up. So we're already behind, right? So we're trying to, we're trying to work with them to help understand how can we look forward and use not only historic data, but look forward and look at projections and use that um, as a design feature um, to, for designing our, our systems. Now, you know, there's one, there's a few different ways to approach this. One is just to require more freeboard or more distance above the flood level and the bottom of your building, for example. Um, but that's just one solution. And I know, I know we have Mr. Mayor Brawley on the phone. Um, I, I might just ask if he wanted to comment. He's an engineer and, and uh, maybe work together. So Matt, if, you're, if you care to comment on this, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, stormwater management. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So I actually left my engineering firm, now work on the developer side for the past year and a half. So I've gotten to see kind of what um, folks like in Lake County with their SMC have implemented over the last um, uh, year or so with the increased rainfall data. So um, it's been interesting. It's been tough from a development side. I mean, to make sure that um, that land is still developable up there and you're storing the required volume that you need. So it's um, it's certainly a change in, in that regard, but, but important. And you're absolutely right that it is backwards looking, that we are looking at historical storms like in DuPage County, they look at a hundred and some um, historical events. I mean, it doesn't really forecast what's happening in the future, which uh, could, it mainly means that our ponds, our stormwater management facilities are not going to be designed for the hundred year in the future. They're going to be designed for, you know, something less than that. So definitely a concern, I think, for, for all of us going forward. Yeah. So, so the mayor's question was, what are we going to do? Not, not sure, uh, Mayor Bennett, what, what we're going to do. But, you know, we, we, we are encouraging them to look forward, not just backwards at, at what might be happening in the future. Thanks, Jason. Uh, uh, any other questions? I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, this is Anne. Hi. Uh, I just want to uh, make a comment on Lake Michigan. Um, the city is obviously really actively following um, the, the lake levels we had, um, obviously last year, we had tons of problems with flooding on Lakeshore Drive and a lot of erosion to the lakefront, um, which we're actively working to address. Um, we are focusing um, this year on, uh, our, we're hoping to get funding to do some revetment projects uh, along Morgan Shoal, which is at like uh, 4,500 South Lakeshore Drive. Also wanna do some planning around Promontory Point uh, and then we are uh, lobbying the federal government to get additional funds to start um, an evaluation of sort of where we should be focusing on the next eight miles of revetment project. So uh, we certainly, uh, it, you know, in consultation with the Army Corps, they feel like we are in for um, some high lake levels likely um, into, the, into the winter and spring months um, and, and the river as high as well, which uh, 
creates lots of complications for us, but we're actively monitoring that um, and, and working uh, with all the businesses downtown that are along the river, as well as homeowners along the lake um, to try to, to mitigate anything that we can. So um, certainly top of mind here at the city. Thanks, Ann. Again, any further questions? Again, Jason, thank you. We'll move on to the legislative update. Uh, Laura on the federal side and Gordon on the state side, whoever wants to go first. So Mayor Bennett, I'll just note here that I know that um, many of us are aware that the federal government is in transition and that veto was canceled at the state level, veto sessions were canceled. So I'll just, uh, Laura and Gordon are on the line if you all have questions, but in terms of a substantive update, <laughs> there isn't too much to report. Are you asking them or? Yeah. <laughs> No, if, if you have, if anybody on the board has questions. Uh, I, th I think the only question for all of us, uh, certainly at the local level is, is going forward in the spring session because it looks, it appears the General Assembly will not be meeting until, until, uh, uh, you know, their normal spring session, if that's even possible. Uh, the concern going forward for all of us is because of the failure of the passing of the fair tax, how the state's going to operate its budget going forward. And we are very concerned at the local level about things like LDGF. And I know the Metropolitan Mayor's Caucus, the Illinois Municipal League are obviously going to be watching very closely and whether or not the task force uh, and or even our agency, uh, Aaron, uh, as usual with the General Assembly, they do things and don't look at the analysis and, and the impact, uh, how it's gonna affect. So I guess keep that in mind uh, for our agency, uh, if they don't wanna do analysis that we, we need to either work with uh, some of the legislative groups out there, the caucus or the IML, and uh, forecasting the impacts if they get into a position of starting to take away local share money. Yeah, I think, you know, as, as we have the expertise uh, in terms of tax policy and analysis and the impacts to the local level, we're having to provide data and that, that level, level of expertise. Okay, thank you. I appreciate it. Any other comments on legislative? Any other business? Uh, any other public comment? I don't believe we got any notifications about public comment in advance. Okay. All right, now we're moving into an area we haven't done before and that's to go to a executive session of Zoom. Uh, first, I need a motion to allow us to do that. Is there a motion? Motion the Healy. Second, Reinbold. Aaron, call the roll. Mayor Bennett? Aye. Rita Athos? Yes. Frank Field? President Brawley? Yes. Commissioner Cox? Uh, yes. Mayor Darch? Yes. Jim Healy? Yes. Mayor Noak? President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rottering? Yes. Carolyn Schofield? Yes. Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. And I'll just, the uh, motion carries, I'll just note that this is pursuant to um, uh, 5 ILCS uh, 120 slash 2 C1 to discuss uh, executive director's performance review and prior and review prior uh, closed session minutes. So the meeting
All right, just want to quickly mention that the board will be coming back after the executive session uh, to end the meeting.
Mayor Bennett, are you back? I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you just fine. Um, Angela, do you want to? Absolutely. I'll go ahead. Great. Uh, in closed session, the board approved draft minutes from November 13, 2019. They approved authorization to release minutes from November 13, 2019. It was also approved continued confidentiality of all other things that was listed and destruction of the recordings after 18 months. Those items were discussed by the uh, board in executive session. They are recommended, they weren't approved. Uh, the purpose of this right now is for the board based upon Angela's report of the meeting uh, that I'll entertain a motion that we approve uh, those items submitted by Angela. Is there a motion? So moved, George. Second, Brother. Moved and seconded. Aaron, you wanna read the roll call? Yep, Mayor Bennett. Aye. Rita Athos. Yes. Frank Beal. Aye. President Brawley. Yes. Commissioner Cox. Mayor Dart. Yes. Jim Healy. Lost him. Huh? Mayor Noak. Oh, look, uh, looks like Jim arrived. Jim Healy, we're uh, doing a roll call vote on releasing the minutes. Hi, I didn't hear, I didn't hear anything. <laughs> no worries, Angela reported that we were uh, releasing the minutes from November 19th, November 13th. Um, Aye. Thank you. Uh, Mayor Noak? President Reinbold? Yes. Mayor Rattering? Aye. Carolyn Schofield? Yes, sorry. No, that's okay. <laughs> Deputy Mayor Sheehan? Yes. Matt Walsh? Yes. Diane Williams? Yes. And the motion carries. Uh, the board, for the record, also discussed uh, the executive uh, director's annual review. Um, and with that in mind, I let the board know that we are not meeting in December as traditional. Thank, thank good for that. We will meet again in January. Erin, anything else I missed at, before I adjourn this? No, I just, you know, uh, this will be a strange holiday season, but I wish you all the best. Great executive committee is coming up next, but, you know, I wish you all the best over the holidays. And, you know, I know small is sometimes not ideal, but, you know, I'm taking, great uh, pleasure in spending a little bit more time with my my kids and my husband. So I hope you all have a great holiday season. Thanks and again to all the board members also. Can I do this by voice vote or do we still have to vote by singular vote? I think to close the meeting, we're okay to do voice vote. All right, um, uh, any other comments or questions of that? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so move. move. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. All those in favor signify by the vote of, by vote of aye. 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 Opposed, vote of, opposed vote of no. That's the way I like to do this. The motion carries. Meeting adjourned. Enjoy the holidays all. Stay safe, please. Thank you. Thank you. Happy, Thanks, Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Bye-bye.